Hey, Jim, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Doug? I'm doing fine, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. You are an author, musician, poet, historian, and playwright, according to your bio. That's a uh, lot of stuff. And radio talk show host. And radio talk show host, okay. What kind of music do you do? Because I'm also a musician, so let's start there, and then we'll get to your books. Okay. Um, I used to, well, I was, uh, I wrote the music for my band in the early 80s, late, well, mid, late 70s, early 80s, called Sundown in uh, Seattle area, Seattle, Tacoma area. Um, we were uh, an acoustic vocal group. Acoustic vocal, uh, like, uh, like Crosby, Stills, Nash? Well, yeah, on that, uh, well, not exactly like them, but uh, on the same vein, yeah. Did you gain any success with your band? We did. We, we played for oh, probably about six years up and down the coast. We, uh, we, you know, get from Northern California all the way up to Vancouver, B.C. Uh, did you ever make any albums or did you record? We made uh, one EP and um, then, uh, actually, no, we, we, well, we did the one EP and that took like a month and a half to do. And uh, other than that, no, we never really made any records. Other than the EP got a lot of play in Seattle. So then you're also an author. And when did you start writing? 2000. Well, actually, when I was a junior in high school, or actually, I was probably a freshman in high school or junior high. Um, but I really got serious about it in 2009. And um, uh, as I was traveling around, I worked, used to work for my dad. And as I was traveling around, I, all this this character kept coming to my mind every time I got out in the open spaces. I used to go from uh, Washington State all the way ha halfway Oregon and eastern Washington, eastern Oregon. So I mean, it would be for hours by yourself out there. And uh, this character started formulating in my mind. And finally, uh, to about 2009, oh, gee, about 20 some years after I quit working for dad, um, I, uh, I decided to tell his story, which... The first book I wrote was called The Hunter, and um, the man I was referring to is a—he's uh, late. Well, he's mid late fifties, early sixties. He's uh, he's a, a manhunter in Arizona in the eighteen eighties, and he's been a manhunter for forever. And um, he hunts. Uh, he takes. He goes and finds people. He's kind of like the modern day private eye. The two books that I've got written down here for you are "That's All You Get" and "Jefferson's Chance." Are those? Your two latest books? Yeah, that's, that's the two latest. Uh, Jefferson's Chance is a story about a young boy who his dream is to be a uh, Texas Ranger because his father is a Texas Ranger. And uh, his father dies, and a couple months later, he's bitten by a rattlesnake and loses the lower portion of his right leg. And he can't become a ranger because he's got a wooden leg. And he, um, unfortunately, or fortunately for him, he runs across a guy that uh, was the uh, engineer on the Waco suspension bridge across the Brazos River in 1870. And he, the guy designed him a new leg that would operate just like a real leg. And, and uh, the old smithy at the end of the street in Austin, Texas, built him the leg. And he, uh, long story short, he becomes a ranger. And they send him on a fool's errand, which turns out not to be. And um, it uh, the book kicks off pretty much about a quarter of the way through it. And the stories I, I really like the story. I, I I just it's one of my very favorite stories, um, and uh, you know he lives up to the Rangers' code, and the Rangers had a creed and a code they had to live by, and and he did. He lived up to it. Is Texas the only state that has Rangers? Because I never hear of any other state. Uh, Arizona any... had Rangers for a while, but uh, they disbanded in the eighteen nineties. So, what exactly is unique about the Rangers versus the? state police or the sheriffs i mean why are they significantly different well the rangers were 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 um they were uh, well i i guess i, I want to say chartered um they didn't belong to any state agency other than the governor they worked strictly for the governor and they and the uh, there was a there was bases set around texas in little towns and they would have between six and twelve rangers there and and uh, they would uh, they would hunt down the people that were nefarious in the areas, like a lot of the real bad bandits, um, the Comancheros, the Comanches. Uh, they were just uh, they were the ones that went after the real bad of the bad of the bad. But they were under the authority of the governor, sort of like the governor's private police force. 
Well, kind of. <laughs> kind of. They made very little money. They had to provide their own horse, their own weapons, their own tack. Um, you know, uh, they had mules assigned to each each um, company that was based around town or about in the country or in Texas. Uh, and they, they would call them ranger mules. And the rangers would you know, name them ridiculous names and and uh, they, you know, to have fun, one of the rangers and one of the stations in Del Rio, Texas, on the border on the Rio Grande across from Mexico, um, it was a very small building. It had six cots in it and twelve rangers. So it was a, it was always like a, it was always like a guessing game as to who was going to get a cot and who was going to sleep on the porch. Because there was that show. I, I, the rangers still exist, right? Absolutely, they have, yeah. but now they're a state police force. Oh, I see. Okay, now they're state police force. Yeah. Right. Uh, and your other book is called That's All You Get. Why don't you tell us about that one? That's All You Get is all the stuff that I wrote from my senior year in high school, 1967, to 1983, 84. Um, some later stuff is thrown in, but not much. Uh, and it's just, uh, there's music lyrics in there, there's poetry in there, there's um, works with other people in there. Um, it's just a bunch of stuff that I put together oh, years ago, 1983 or four, I think is when I, it was first copywritten. Um, and I finally, because now we have a little publishing company, I was finally able to get it published and, and out of the market. And I'm really proud of that because there's some good stuff in there. Can you give us an example? You said there's lyrics and stuff you want to read. Um, just yeah, to... I, I, if you don't mind, I, I, yeah. sure. Just read us a, a short bit. I, I just happen to have one here. Oh, good. Well, you're prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did I did one piece called, um, actually, what I used to do when I wrote music, if you're a musician, then you probably have done this if you write music. Um, I, I used to have a book I kept. In fact, I still have the book. And I used to write titles down into the book, and then I would go and write the music for the for the song, and the the words. And you know, that's sometimes how I got my music. I, I mean, this particular one is called Moses from the Mountain. Um, that the other one was, was like um, uh, the Schillerman's daughter, and there was a few others that are in there. Um, this one is called Moses from the Mountain, and this is just a it's, it's a real short, about three stanzas. Okay. Okay, it's through battle lines we've sacrificed our innocence to pray. From mountainside they've heard our cry, can still be heard today. The dust and dawn we battle on and stumble on our way. We've earned our way to hell today, and they're sure to make us pay. Come down from your mountain, Moses, come running if you can. Come see the burning tree or the tablet in your hand. Come down from your bastion, Moses, come running with your lives. Show men the evil world and the fire in your eyes. We've cheated and we've stolen. We've threatened and we've lied. We've tried to say it's okay today, but we've never really tried. On a dusty road lies a wayward soul searching for a line where the right to live and one to die. He'll know the reason why. Come down from the mountain, Moses. Come running if you can. Let us see the burning tree or the tablet in your hand and come down from your bastion, Moses. Come running with your lives. Show man the evil world and the godly fire in your eyes. Oh, that's good. And that's Moses from the Mountains. Is that a poem or a song lyric? That actually was a song. Okay. It's sort of hard to tell the difference, really, between the poetry well, and the I, song. Well, I have a theory about that. In fact, in, in the, uh, if, oh, well, if you, I, I should, probably should have sent you a copy. Um, let me see here. I did a, or an intro. Um uh, this is what I wrote in my intro. I spend hours crafting pose, prose, poetry, and lyrics for music written or yet to be unwritten, and in doing so discovered one basic truth of life and writing. Whereas music bars and notes come and go, the lyric or the poetry of the song, if you will, is immortal. They can take you far away to exotic lands or leave you on your couch watching the rain fall endlessly during the fall, the winter, and the spring. Follow a whaling vessel in search of the blue whale. Sing the lament of a young man alone in the ocean or follow the battles raging or yet to be raging in a young soldier's heart. So that's what I think is that the notes and the bars and the music come and go. Um, but the words are everlasting. Well, I suppose that's true. Although there have been a few tunes that uh, have been stuck in my head for the last 40 years. <laughs> Well, sure. I mean, you know, I, it happens with everybody. I, you know, there's tunes that have been stuck in my head, too. Um, 
well, actually one that I wrote actually kind of rolls around in my brain every now and then. But um, the, I mean, there, there's so much music that's written that, that sounds a lot alike, uh, but the lyrics and the, and the words are different, and, and that's what makes it different. And, you know, there's only so many combinations of chords and notes well, that's, you can put together. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. And you're right, a lot of songs musically do sound a lot yes. alike. Yes, yes. You could take the same four chords and write a whole bunch of different mel melodic combinations. Well, they did but if it's the, the same four chords, right, like, like they did in the 50s. Right. But if it's the same four chords and the same beat and the same timing, you, they're interchangeable. You could Absolutely. sing one, one melody within the same other song, right? Right. Yeah. That's what makes jazz bass so easy to play. <laughs> jazz bass is usually four chord riffs and you know and rock and roll in the early 50s or mid to late 50s was all c a minor f and g most of it so you know you know if you learn anything learn c a minor f and g throw in a d every now and then and you you know, you're probably a miracle worker well you've probably covered most of the songs from the 1950s and early 60s Abs absolutely yeah absolutely yeah that's true and you're right about jazz because jazz is just a melody within a melody within a melody. You're just going sure. on and on and on, you know. Right. And rock and roll just basically took the same chords and just shortened it into a three minute pop song. Right. And that, I think that went on even into the early 60s. And I think the one that really broke out of that um, probably was Paul Simon more than anything. Um, he had chord changes and stuff that no one had ever heard of before, and he he made them work, and they were tremendous. And and his you know the the guitar playing I think is what caught a lot of people's attention. Plus, their voices were wonderful. But but uh, I you know I think he broke that mold, and um, went into the folk rock era, and then a lot of other people started emulating Paul Simon, and you know it just got worse from there. But <laughs> I, I, Paul Simon, I think uh, that's how I learned how to finger pick actually. To partially saves Rosemary in time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I agree with you on Paul Simon. He definitely fused uh, several styles of music together, folk, and he also he also had a gospel edge to him too, with things like Bridge Over Troubled Water and um, very much so. You know who else was very uh, ingenious was Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Absolutely. Yeah, he he started doing chords that even that song like the warmth of the sun, which is basically right. the four chord fifties ballad, but he mixed the chords up. He switched them around. Well, it, it made music more interesting when the, when a lot of the artists, and and I say artists, I I say um, you know a lot of the guitar artists of the age of the sixties, especially, um, uh, golly, uh, Judy. Um, Oh, what's, her, what's her name? Judy Collins, Buffy St. Marie, uh, horrible singer, but a great guitar player. Joan Baez, uh, Bob Dylan. A lot of them, uh, you know, started using a lot of minors and seventh chords and which really made a difference in the sound of their music. And I, and I really liked that a lot. So when I started writing my own music, I, I, I started using chord progressions. Uh, well, I will, I will. I will not lie. I did steal some. <laughs> well, everybody's stolen some, but if you're going to steal, <laughs> steal from the good people. You know, that's, yeah, exactly that's the rule right. of thumb. Don't steal from the bad steal ones. Steal from the best. <laughs> yeah, steal from the best. Absolutely. All right, Jim, we got to wrap this up. Do you have a website you want to give out? I do. It's uh, jimchristina.net. That's J-I-M-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A dot net. Um, we have, uh, of course, I'm on Facebook, Jim Christina. I'm on, uh, you can go to my uh, publishing page, uh, blackdogpublishing.co or tuscanybaybooks.com. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming on the show and sharing. It was nice meeting you. Nice talking to you. My pleasure, Douglas. It's been a pleasure.